We all dream of fame and success, but not all our dreams come true. What makes our achievers' dreams come true? Our guest today is Sohail Set, not one to hold back his punches. He's a columnist, a branding guru, an ad man, a TV actor, and a socialite. Let's welcome Sohail. One of the most admired marketing and management gurus and a highly regarded columnist, Sohail, welcome to our show, Achievers. Thank you for having me. So Sohail, you wear many hats on your very salt and pepper curly hair. You're an ad man, you're a branding guru, you're an actor, you're a columnist, and um, you're also a socialite. Uh, which role defines you best? Neither, because, you know, I think uh, getting human beings into silos is the biggest mistake. Would you define Mahatma Gandhi as a lawyer, as an activist, as a freedom fighter? Would you say Nelson Mandela was a, humanita a humanitarian a zealot? Would you say he was someone who gave South Africa freedom? And what's happening is over time I'm seeing hmm. descriptions have become very important in the world. So if someone were to ask me what I'd be, just a normal guy who enjoys living every moment of his life not worrying about what's going to happen next. Did you always have a very clear vision of where you wanted to be in your life? Which direction you wanted to head? On the contrary, no. <clears throat> when I was growing up, I was very keen on becoming a police officer because I wanted to beat up rogue politicians. <clears throat> <clears throat> then that kind of changed. And for years, I pursued theatre. Hmm. And I said to myself that my life would be really well lived if I could find myself a home very small <clears throat> with an attic where I could rehearse and get, you know, mm. our team to rehearse. But I think uh, life has been exceedingly kind. Mm. And the worst kind of life is when you plan. I'm not going to use the old cliche of, you know, what man proposes, blah, blah, blah. But because you want to live for the moment and you live in the present, there is a lot to learn from life. You must seize opportunities that present themselves before you. You mustn't go out and be greedy for opportunities. The mistake that most human beings make is they treat life as a moving target. Life isn't a dartboard. It's not about saying, OK, today I must get into zone A, tomorrow mm. I must get into zone B. Mm. You've got to actually enjoy the zone you're in. So you're saying I go with the flow? Well, go with the flow, to my mind, is more punk uh, logic than reality. I would say go with what presents itself before you. Hmm. And judge yourself on three counts. A, are you competent to take up that opportunity? B, will you be credible while taking up that opportunity? And C, will you invoke or will it invoke passion in you? If it does these three things, I don't think you need to worry. But you've always been a very creative soul. You must have known earlier on in your childhood that creativity is within you. No, on the contrary, and I'm not being, uh, you know, falsely humble here. All my life, I was involved in the sciences. Yes, one thing which my parents taught uh, me was the art of reading and the importance of scholarship. You know, we've got to read. Hmm. You've got to be interesting. You've got to have a worldview. You can't be tunnel visioned. You can't create a life which only celebrates one aspect of this planet and not the other. Hmm. So to that extent, we were creative, or I was creative. But I always wanted to do things which would be off the beaten path. Mm. So in school, and I was a pure science student, <clears throat> when people would go home and do biology tutorials, mm. I'd actually go and watch films. <clears throat> and you know, I think a lot of it, Sadia, is also relevant to where we grew up. Mm. I grew up in Calcutta, which was the cradle of civility, not just civilization, it was the cradle of civility. Mm. It was the cradle of culture. People to this day in Calcutta don't ask you what you do. They respect you for what you are. And it's a city which allows you to breathe the cultural environment to its fullest. Hmm. They celebrate the fact that you can go out and watch a play. They don't judge you. You know, in most cities, if you said, oh, I want to watch theater, I want to go for a play, they'd either classify you as someone who has no work or someone who's being pretentious about culture. But in Calcutta, these were real things. Debating happened in the same way. Hmm. Public speaking was, to my mind, an adjunct to what you did in theater. Mm. The ability to speak. But everyone says, oh, but why public speaking? People don't realize that if you're debating 
and if you're addressing people in large numbers, public speaking forces you to be two things, logical and crisp. Often enough, we are a world of ramblers. We don't come to the point because we don't know where we're going and we don't know what we want to communicate. So there was theatre, yeah. which allowed you to express yourself in a believable, honourable manner, which would help you engage with the audiences. And then there was debating, which allowed you to maintain a certain logical air to what you were saying. So in both cases, the end result was engagement with the audience mm. and believability, which shouldn't be sacrificed. So coming back to your debating, you were, you were an amazing debater growing up and you still debate both nationally and internationally. Do you think that the skill set um, you acquired while debating has helped your career? I'm sure it has, uh, because as I said, the ability to communicate logically and with conviction mm. will help you no matter what you're doing. You could be a receptionist in a call center, mm. you could be someone doing a television program, you could be someone who's filming shows, a production executive. You could also be a chief executive. And if you look around us, we've lost the art of public speaking globally. Mm. You know, we quote from Steve Jobs' commencement day speech at Stanford, and we remember, stay hungry, be foolish. But the days of Lincolnian addresses, what Churchill brought to the world, you know, those celebratory speech craft, that celebratory speech craft is missing. Why do you think that's the case? Because I don't think people are involved with the world beyond their, you know, puny little tunnels. People don't want to explore. When was the last time you went out and saw two swans actually having a conversation in a nearby park. We've stopped doing that. We lead hurried lives. Mm. And when you lead a hurried life, the only thing you sacrifice is the calmness of the environment that you're part of, which you can't actually get away from. Mm. So I think to answer your question, of course it would have helped me in my career. I think both public speaking and theater allows you to do you know, the right enunciation, the right intonation, you know, the right pronunciation. But don't you think the most important tool public speaking gives you, or debating gives you, is confidence? And you have an abundance of confidence, both on screen and off screen. I think a lot of engineers are confident, those who are writing software programs. I think people uh, who are cameramen in uh, films or television are very confident. But it's not about confidence which can't be exuded. Mm. So to that end, you're absolutely right. What public speaking allows you to do is transfer your confidence to a bunch of people mm. who are not part of your immediate career path or your universe. So mm. it's that engagement which it allows for. Mm. And um, you've, in your interviews, you've spoken very fondly of your parents. And so what role did they play in your success? I think they played the most uh, important role and they continue to. See, I'm a great believer that we are not birds. Mm. You know, we don't live in nests and then throw out the bird when the bird is ready to fly and then have no relationship with parents. Mm. To my mind, parental relationships are the, I would say the most critical because yep. you've got to respect parents for, for two or three things. Number one, they are the ones who have unconditional love. Mm. A parent never has conditionalities to love. Number two, they have unabashed forgiveness they will forgive you all your sins, including murder. And we've seen stories across the world of parents actually going out and defending mm -hmm. their wards. And the third thing is, they will give you advice which doesn't have an agenda. Where else would you get people like that? Your parents were very supportive of your choices? You wanted to be an actor at an early age? Well, they weren't, but then they knew that I was one stubborn bloke. Uh, I did pure science and you know, I got into uh, IIT, which is the premier technology institute. Mm. And then I decided that I'd study English literature. And my father almost had a stroke saying, you know, there are very few people in those days mm. out of a country of 20 million people who'd apply for IIT, about 700 mm. would get in. And it was a surefire career path. But mm. then I wouldn't be on this couch. I'd be somewhere in Silicon Valley and you wouldn't have heard of me. Yeah. So why would I do that? But you took your stand. I took my stand, but I, and it was a reasoned stand. Mm. I told my parents, up to class 12, I did what you wanted me to do. Now you must allow me the convenience of pursuing my path. So you debated your way through that. Absolutely. <laughs> Which is why I say logic is an yes. extremely attractive ingredient in, you know, moving on in life. 
skill set well learned. Um, you started your career working in various advertising agencies and then you started your own advertising agency with your brother Aquas. Following that, you started your company called Consolage. Tell us a little about Consolage. <clears throat> well, let me just rewind. I only worked with one agency. I've been a pretty loyal person in terms of career. I worked with Ogilvy. I started as a management trainee in mm. 1990 at a princely salary of 650 rupees to which my dad told me that, the, that our chauffeur earned about four times as much, but that was yes. irrelevant. Mm. And from Ogilvy, I joined a company uh, to market tobacco mm. products, which I shouldn't have done, but I was doing my job. Mm. Then I joined Peregrine in Hong Kong, why which is an investment bank. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you, I, but I why think, shouldn't you have done that? I think I harm myself. I'm not so worried about how many consumers I must have harmed, mm. but in the process, you harm yourself. Then I joined uh, an investment bank, and then I started Equus, mm. and I asked Martin Sorrell to be a partner, Martin Sorrell WPP. Mm. But I got tired of advertising. And I got tired pretty soon. I was meeting these young marketing managers who hadn't stepped out of their ivory towers, mm. air conditioned and plushly carpeted at that. They didn't know the market. They, want, they, didn't, they didn't want to travel. Mm. There was no cerebral engagement. You know, when we were in advertising, we'd go out and have a drink with a client. Mm. It was a relationship of equals. I've often said in my speeches, and advertising people are still gluttons for punishment to keep inviting me back, and I've said, Advertising agencies crawl when asked to walk. That relationship today is one of civility. Mm. It's not one of equality. In 2006, April 1, it wasn't a Fool's Day uh, program, I decided to retire. I had enough money to lead a reasonable life. And uh, then I met someone from the House of Tatars, and Mr. Tata and Mr. Krishna Kumar told me, you know, what the hell are you doing? How mm. can you retire at such a young age? So I said, you know, I'm relaxed. It's, it's a good life. What do you want to do? I said, I only want to advise chairpersons and CEOs, and I want to charge the earth. Hmm. That's how counselage began. So it began on the back of very strong and solid relationships. But were you that confident you could charge the earth and get the right yeah, clients? For the simple reason that there are two ways of playing any marketing game. Hmm. Either you go through volume and you're a detergent, or you go through value and you're a bejeweled watch. Which one would you like? <laughs> I'll go for the watch. <laughs> so there's no, there's no rocket science to yeah. this. So when I was told, why would you charge the earth? I said, A, it allows me to get rid of all the fluff and the faff. Hmm. B, if you charge a whole host of money sums, people listen to you with more seriousness. Otherwise, they don't you know, heed the advice you give. But wasn't your brother working with you in Aquas? Yeah, and my brother continues to run <clears throat> the advertising agency. But he was okay with you going your separate ways? Absolutely. You know, I'd run Equus from 1996 to 2006 for 10 years. Hmm. It was his uh, business now, and, you know, he's running it. I don't get involved. I don't even know what they do, which clients hmm. they work with. The ability must not be to always live in the past. History is a country without any inhabitants, hmm. only memories or statements. So when I walked away on April 1, 2006, for me, it was a clean break. I would have nothing to do with advertising. I would have nothing to do with Equus. I'd certainly have nothing to do with Martin Sorrel. May hmm. they rest in peace or turmoil, but I would have nothing to do with them. And I was very, very clear. You know, it's not that someone tells you, oh, but would you recommend an advertising agency, you know, now that I advise chairman CEOs? Hmm. I said, I won't get into it. Because you've got to take not just a considered stand, but you've got to have the ability to move on and move ahead. Mm. You know, life is not an umbilical cord. Mm. Even an umbilical cord is cut at childbirth. Well, some people <laughs> keep latching on to it. Well, no. if they do, they yeah. do. But you know, at their own sufferance. Mm. Because I genuinely believe that you can't move on if you're anchored. Have you ever seen a ship sail with its anchor down in the sea? No. no. So, you know, you can't say, oh, I want to go ahead, but still I want to retain some of the past. Mm. And that, to my mind, is yet another element of the avarice of the normal human being. Mm. We don't want to let go. We don't want to let go in relationships. We don't want to let go in terms of, you know, the work we do. We always want to be there. But don't you think that's human nature? Of course it is. But, you know, human nature also needs to evolve. 
there was a time in society which when we began, and I'm not even getting into who came first, but you look at the Adam Eve situation, hmm. they were in love without being married. Today, you know, I've often heard the quote and people ask me, why aren't you married? I said, you can either be married or happy, but that's not a, a, a statement on hmm. marriage. Hmm. My whole perspective is that to each his own. Today, we've gone back to very high divorce rates hmm. because the individuality which was suppressed over centuries by one dominant partner or the other has now frittered away and for the right reasons. Financial independence is not the reason why women or men come into their own. It is their ability to believe, it is to use the word you keep mentioning, confidence, hmm. that yes, I can move ahead without someone's participation in my life. And it's not about dependency. So I think that you know, the understanding of history, to my mind, is a critical element in defining the future. Mm -hmm. Living in history is a bad idea. So coming back to your, um, you know, your experience in advertising, what, how do you judge an advert? What makes an advert memorable? An advertisement is judged by only one thing and one thing alone. Mm -hmm. Does it sell the product or does it win the creative joker an award? If it wins the creative guy an award and doesn't sell the product, it's a bad ad, simple. This whole thing about creativity and all is utter rubbish. Creativity cannot be at the sacrifice of brands that have invested hugely. So I've had in my life copywriters come to me with flowery language and I've said, but what are you selling? Hmm. And I used to have a simple way of judging advertising. And I, you know, I don't wanna blow my own, I judged advertising pretty well. You know, we launched hmm. very successful brands. There was a bread, there was a brand of bread, and it was great bread, but how can I make bread exciting for you? Mm. So we ran limericks which said, Bakwas advertising, first class bread. Which means the advertising is silly, but the bread is great. And you yeah. know, that's how- It worked. It worked, and today it's the biggest brand in India, 98% market share. Mm. So the point is, you've got to have advertising which is unique. You know, I remember, the grand old man of hoteliering, hmm. Bicky O'Broy's father, Rai Bahadur O'Broy, the day he died, hmm. at that time I was working on a rival hotel brand, and I knew Bicky O'Broy would be worried and concerned with making funeral arrangements for his father, hmm. and the agency would be still crawling. So I ran an ad the next day with the Namaste, which was the sign of that rival hotel chain, saying, Rai Bahadur MS O'Broy, Salam. I mean, Bicky O'Broy yeah. calls me the next day, he says, what the hell, you hijacked my dad? Mm. I said, no, he's dead. We hijacked the idea. So it's very important for advertising, to my mind, to play the role of honesty, and a lot of the advertising isn't, and to sell the product. So think outside the box. Not only think outside the box, think the consumer. Get under the skin of the consumer. Understand what the consumer wants. The biggest myth is, at times, even the consumer doesn't know what he wants. The story of Apple is not a story of technology. Hmm. It's a story of inventing desire. Steve Jobs invented desire in everything you touched. Hmm. Otherwise, you wouldn't be buying iPad 1, iPad 2, iPad 3. Hmm. You wouldn't have a situation where Apple today has $97.6 billion to give back in dividend. These are successful companies. What did Facebook do? Facebook stoked the desire that every human being has of peeping into everyone else's lives. Yeah. Facebook is not about <laughs> friendship. Facebook is about telling the guy, mine is bigger than yours, whether it's car, home, friend circle. So that's reality. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's human nature. I mean, hmm. you know, there's no judgment call that we need to make. But the most successful brands have been brands that have understood the consumer, hmm. that have had a relationship and not been transactional. That's why they're successful. So, <clears throat> Aquas recently created a very memorable, and some may say, <laughs> some may say, let a me very finish. Risky ad. A risky ad, which read, quote unquote. So, Hale has a very small one. Yes. With the shape of a small banana next to the word small. What was the idea behind that advert? It was a, I think it was done by my brother to win an award, though he says it was done to my brief. <clears throat> Counselage, because of my commitment to culture, and you know, I, I'm not.
the Tatas or, you know, the Mahindras, but I mm. still sponsor a large part of the Jaipur Literature Festival. Mm. And the Jaipur Literature Festival has a brochure, so you've got to do a company ad. Mm. So my brief to my brother was, Councilage is happy that it works with a few, but it actually works with the best. I'm happy to be small, mm -hmm. but I know I work with the best, yeah. <clears throat> which is a fact. We work with, of the 14 clients I work with, yeah. each one of them is number one in their category. Hmm. And it's very, very difficult to achieve that. And I'm a one-person show. So when I gave my brother the brief, this is the ad he churned out, and he thought I'd be like squeamish about it, but then I know the media pretty well. Yes. Now, what he did was he tweeted, but he has very few followers, so that there was no damage done there. Okay. And I know no one reads a brochure, so mm -hmm. there was no damage done there. What we didn't figure out was that you'd read it. <laughs> so now about millions of viewers will know about it, but who cares? Well, it was a good one. I think, you know, it, it was memorable. And I think it went <laughs> with my ability to be provocative. So I think a lot of people say it must be Suhail's idea which Swapan has crafted, but yeah. it was the other way around. <laughs> Okay, you, um, moving on. You've acted in countless plays and you were also in the recent movie, Guzarish. Now, you're clearly a very talented actor. Why didn't you just put all your energy in acting and focus on acting? Because who knows, you could have been the next Bachchan or the next Khan. Good point. <clears throat> but you know, we grew up in Calcutta, which had a certain snobbishness about cinema. Hmm. Even in Calcutta, when I worked with Brinal Sen and you know, I did the Ray short films, a lot of people said, oh, but why would you go to Bollywood? Why would you go to Bombay? So Bombay was seen as this really crass place which no one would inhabit. I did uh, Guzarish because Leela Bansali's casting director mm. called me. I still remember I was in Spain on holiday and she said, <clears throat> would you do the role? I said, I will only agree to doing the role once I read it. So I read the role. It was the role of a doctor. Mm. And the film, as you know, is about... Rithik Roshan yes. being a paraplegic. And it's about euthanasia. And I had done a play <clears throat> by Brian Clark called Whose Life Is It Anyway? Mm. Which then became a famous film with Richard Dreyfuss, mm. which is also about euthanasia. Now euthanasia, in order to act in Whose Life Is It Anyway? Where I played the paraplegic, I knew the laws that are prevalent across the world. And I also knew the, the passionate discontent that lies within the heart of a paraplegic. Hmm. So it was not a cinema role for me. It was very expressive, it was very cerebral, and most importantly, it was very enjoyable. And Leela Bansali is a great director. He almost takes as long as some of you guys must take to light up, but hmm. no, I'm just joking. <laughs> but he's, he's almost as laborious and hmm. as anal about the slightest of, uh, of detailing. But why didn't you give acting your hundred percent? Because when you were on set, of course, you would give it your hundred percent. But you were, in, you know, you were so involved in your advertising career. Do you think if you just focus on acting, that acting is too much of a gamble? I can tell you of some of the finest actors in India, hmm. some of the finest actors in the world, who've never made a mark in cinema. Great actors on theatre have not been as eminently successful in cinema, hmm. because to my mind, cinema is a lot about it's it's like a gamble. And a film, you're only as good as your last film. And the good is defined by success. It's not defined by, you know, the, the inherent qualities of that movie. Guzarish is a great film to my mind, not because I've acted in it, but it's bombed in the box office. So these are the realities that I didn't want to. And I'm, you know, one other thing, I've never gambled. I don't go to casinos, I don't play cards. I don't go to the Derby. Mm. So for me, cinema would have been a gamble. And I was too confident not to take a gamble, which I knew would be a gamble and may go either way. So it's not about being risk averse. I just thought the whole exercise to be stupid. But I understand that no particular role defines you. But what do you enjoy doing most? When Everything. you're in front of the camera, when you're creating a branding strategy, Everything. when you're public speaking? When I'm walking in St. James's Park here, or I'm uh, <clears throat> going scuba diving, I enjoy doing everything. So, in more ways than one, I am a jack of all trades and a master of none, but a mistress to the enjoyable vistitude mm. of life. And that's what we've got to be. You know, this, this whole thing, please focus on one thing. What are you really good at? I don't know. I could make a very mean andeki bhurji. Mm. So, you know, would you say I'm a good cook? 
I could also teach you the tango, not that you don't know. Hmm. So, Actually, I don't know. So then I could <laughs> teach you the tango. But the point is, you know, to say, what are you hmm. actually good at? You enjoy everything. And being good, to my mind, is all contextual. It's all benchmarking. Hmm. Some say you're famous for being famous. True. In your opinion, what <clears> is your <throat> claim to fame? You know, you know, now that's another, to my mind, it's an interesting phrase that has been used. But to my mind, that's a misnomer only on logical grounds. Hmm. You can't be famous for being famous because in the first place, you would have to be famous for something. Otherwise, you wouldn't hmm. get there. After that, what happens is you do, and, and I completely agree that this may be true, not just for me, for anyone who's, if you'd call it that, famous. Hmm. Why are you famous? If you're on television with a point of view every day, you have that little celebrity hood or, you know, the famous phrase added to your life. Hmm. But people have to realize that you didn't get there because you were born into, you know, a filmy family or you were hmm. a politician's son or daughter. So you've got to make sure that you work the steps. A, B, what you've also got to realize is that fame is equally transitional. There will be a better public speaker tomorrow. There, there will be and there are better actors. So did fame just happen or did you seek it? I think it just happened. I would never seek it. In fact, in my public or in my actually private persona, qua the public, mm. I hate meeting people. I have the same set of friends. Yes, I add friends, but I maintain one-on-one -on -one relationships with them. You know, I don't go out and pump flesh. Now, a lot of people say, oh, we saw you on page three. When I ask them for what, they say, oh, that we don't remember. Now, the tragedy is, whether it is England or India or America, the page three press is coming into mainstream activities. Michael Douglas and I did a book reading for the Taj in New York on October 18 last year. And the page three press of the tabloid press was in New York. Now, why on earth would I be blamed? I'm, I'm not stripping or advertising some jewels mm. or taking part in an egg hunt mm. or being paraded like an elephant. <laughs> <coughs> there, there it was. So there's the press. We will continue our conversation with Suhail Seth shortly. See you after a break. Mm -hmm.